Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Welcome back to Investing Month. Today, we're going to talk about what brokers are, and they're pretty much the practical way to buy shares and ETFs in Australia. Yeah, most people live through their brokerage these days. Most investors, Kate, they think, well, if I'm going to invest in something, I'm going to do it through my brokerage account. And everyone that hasn't experienced a brokerage account immediately says, what's that? And so we're going to cover that. And we're also going to cover which one, which is typically the next question. And you'll find out there are quite a few. Uh, and you can test drive them for free. Yes. So it's pretty cool. So why don't we just start off with what is a broker? Yeah. So it's pretty much a digital marketplace that allows me to buy and sell investments. So if I really want to buy shares of let's pick an Australian company, Commonwealth Bank, instead of finding Owen, who yep. might have some shares, and saying, hey, do you want to sell them to me? What price do you want to pay? How are we going to sort out all the paperwork? How are we going to? How am I going to transfer you the money? A broker just does this all automatically in the background. So once I open a brokerage account, I can tell my broker just by filling in a few details that I want to buy shares in this company, and they go out and do all the heavy lifting for me. Okay. So the broker's connected to the stock market. The stock market is where everyone is operating. And the broker can see if there are other sellers. So if I'm selling my Commonwealth Bank shares, you're buying them. I might have an offer to sell. So my shares are on offer, for example, $100 a share for one share. That's the share price, for example. And you come along and you're like, I want one share for $100. I'll submit a bid. It's matched with my offer. Presto. Done. Bam. Now you become the shareholder of Commonwealth Bank. And you get the money from me. And, and that's simple. Okay, yeah. right. So you use a broker to both buy an investment and to sell that investment in the future. It sounds weird because broker, people normally think of like mortgage broker or like yeah. a car broker or something like this where there's like someone in between, You're like a person. With a person, yeah. And that's because they, it used to be the case that you would do that. Yeah, you used to, if you talk to your grandparents, they probably had to call someone up, up if they wanted to buy shares. Yeah, and really, you can still do that. That's called what, that's what we call a full service stockbroker. Full service meaning that you can go and see them and they'll give you ad advice on the portfolio for your cir circumstances. Whereas 99% of the investors that I come across nowadays do not do that. They just go straight to the website or they have the app, which is available, and they can place their trades, they can fund their account, and they can do everything themselves. Um, we are sponsored by a broker. Uh, just for full disclosure, the broker's name is Perla. So we, if we do mention that today, it's not because we're paid to do so. It's literally just because we're talking about them as an example, just for full disclosure. So you mentioned, Kate, generally like what they do, but how do they actually work? Like what if I'm a user... First time, what can I expect? Yeah. So the first thing you'll have to do is once you've picked a broker, so we'll go through a couple of examples, mm -hmm. you will have to open an account and provide all of those important details, like if you applied for anything else. So you'll yeah. have to tell them your identity. You'll have to provide some details like your driver's license to confirm that, tell them your address, things like your tax file number, and then they create an account for you. And that's called a brokerage account. Mm -hmm. And this is your specific account that allows you to buy and sell investments, but also hold them. Mm -hmm. So this is sometimes connected to a bank account that they create for you. So when you go through the process, they'll say, do you want a bank account or do you want to link your own bank account? Oftentimes, most common these days is you do not link. You just use whatever bank account they have and you just transfer money in and out. Yeah. And most brokers will check that the money's in that account before they let you place an order. So if you want to buy $500 of shares, you need to have $500 in that bank account. Yeah. Ready to go. So this is really important because um, the next step after creating the account is funding it. Some of these uh, brokers allow you to do it instantly. 
and you can just use pay ID or you can use a direct deposit or you can use maybe even your card to transfer money, Apple Pay, whatever. Some brokers do, however, take a day or two to process your application and to get you an active account. But in the meantime, you can still use the platform. You just can't actually process a trade straight away. Um, and when you log in, you search for your shares, your ETFs or whatever you're buying from your brokerage account. And you basically search for it by the name. So there's like a search window up the top or you search for it by what we call a ticker symbol. So, Kate, do you want to tell us what a ticker symbol is? Yeah, so it's I wouldn't, you usually refer to it as a barcode, but it might be a three or four letter code that represents that company. So, for example, Commonwealth Bank, you would have to search CBA. Yeah. Sometimes they don't make as much sense like that. Yeah. And, and an exchange traded fund, an ETF we'll mention in this episode, that will also have its own code. For example, VAS, which is something we'll probably mention. Yeah, it's the Vanguard Australian Shares. So you can see where yeah. it gets the VAS. They actually don't have control over what the letters are. They get they can apply for them, but the ASX, the stock market, tells them what they can and can't do. Um, now, this is a really important distinction. We get a lot of people asking this question is when you get your brokerage account, it does not necessarily mean you can go and buy Apple shares or Google shares or Microsoft shares. Why? Because they're US companies. So they're on the United States stock market, not on the Australian stock market, which is sometimes just called the ASX. Yeah. So, however, oh, by default, when you open an Australian brokerage account, it will generally just connect you to the Australian market. So you can buy Australian mm. companies and other Australian investments. Yep. But once you've done that, you can apply for the US market or international markets as well, right? Yeah. So the most common market you can access is the US. US stock market, it's a little trickier and probably not necessary for beginners to access other international markets, especially at the beginning. But say you wanted to buy a share in a company like Disney, which is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, you would need to activate or apply. It's a bit different depending on which broker and they don't all offer it to open a US brokerage account that connects you to the US market that allows you to then buy and sell US companies. Yeah. So three names that we might just put to you. There is a guide available in the show notes, so you can check that out. But three names that we might uh, mention to you, these are popular in our community, are Comsec, Perla and Stake. Um, so Comsec's the biggest in Australia for the Australian shares. So and that's been going for a very long time. It's one of the originals. That's why it's so big. And it comes under Commonwealth Bank. Yeah. Um, and then you've got Perla, which does... So all of these do both US and Australian, but they do it in a different way. Perla, um, who's a sponsor of the show, as I've already mentioned, they are more focused on like automation. So rather than even having to log in, can you place a trade, for example? Stake started with the United States market only. They call that Wall Street. That's like a Wall Street side of their account. And then you have the Australian one as well, the ASX side. Um, and all three of them do the same thing, but in a very different way. And they have different like partners behind the scenes that help them exist, in yeah. effect. Um, but they're all regulated. And I yeah. think that's an important point to bring up, is that they're all regulated by an Australian regulator called ASIC, A-S-I-C. You can check on the, the ASIC website if they have an, a license to operate. Yeah. And there's a number of reasons why we might pick one brokerage account or two. You're allowed multiple brokerage accounts. That's probably something we should mention. Yep. So you can open a couple, give them a test drive, and then decide which one you want to go with or which two, and then you can close the rest. So yep. that is something mm -hmm. that, to keep in mind at the start. But one of the reasons why you might choose one brokerage account over another is the brokerage fee. So by doing all of this hard work in the background, the broker charges you a fee for mm -hmm. this service, which is fair. And that could range from $3 to $20 every time you make a purchase and make a sale of an investment. Yeah. And when investors are just starting out, they are typically very fee conscious. So chances are, if you're listening to this, you're like, why don't I just go with the cheapest one? The amount of times we've been at events, Kate, and people have said, why don't you just talk about the cheapest one? Or why don't Because there are many other reasons why you might not want the cheapest one. Um, and to be honest, for many of us, um, paying an extra couple of dollars isn't that big of a deal. Probably what's more important is like, is it user-friendly? Do yeah. I get my tax reports? Does it connect with my share site for portfolio tracking? I wonder Vexa for portfolio tracking. Does the platform make it easy to understand? Is there an app? Yeah. Can I automate this? 
you know, so there's many different reasons why you might choose one or the other, not just fees, but it's definitely one of the important considerations. Yeah, because a lot of people, when they're researching brokerage accounts, they'll they'll list them from lowest cost to highest cost, and they'll look towards the lowest cost options. But there may be some platforms in the middle. There's definitely some really expensive ones that we don't talk about as yeah. often, but there's some in the middle between that 3 and $20 mark that have a lot of really helpful features for investors. Yeah. So what we're talking about here is a brokerage fee. This is the fee that you pay when you buy or when you sell. Um, and for example, let's say you want to buy $1,000 of Commonwealth Bank shares. And let's say the shares were exactly $1,000. The broker would add the fee on top. So say it was $10, it'd be $1,000 and $10 that comes out of your account. Um, now, the minimum that they want you to invest when you buy shares for the first time is 500 bucks. So in this case, you might want 500 plus the brokerage fee, which could be five, 10, 20 bucks, whatever. Um, and people often ask us, well, you know, should I be investing in a set amount? There is no real set amount, but what we tend to see over the long term is people tend to make monthly investments or every two months of a thousand dollars or more. And the reason is that it kind of covers the cost of brokerage, which you have to pay each time. Um, but there are, you know, I personally think, Kate, one of the things that I think is actually good about not fees not falling any further is the fact that you have to pay a fee stops people from over trading in their account, buying and selling too much. Yeah. And that is a danger. If you don't pay any fees, you could just constantly buy and sell on a daily basis, which as you'll remember in our first episode, that's more categorized as trading behavior, not investing behavior because you're not focused on the long term. Yeah. Because you don't actually benefit from the companies getting more valuable. You're just trying to predict what goes up and down. And that's much more risky and more speculative. Um, so whereas if you're just trying to focus on the companies as a whole or the ETF, which is the market as a whole, uh, that's how you do that. Okay. So if I don't have 500 bucks, but I want to get started today, are there any options? Yes. So there are things called micro investing, or you might see the word fractional investing platforms. So some are like a company called Raise, which used to be called Acorns, which is quite popular with yeah, Australians. Popular. I think you still use it. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Yep. Um, and that allows you to invest just $5 or round up your spare change into a investment portfolio that they put together for you. So, so it's kind of like pre-configured. Yeah. So you could pick a, a high growth portfolio and they put a bit of all of those different investment things we mentioned earlier. There might be some Australian and US shares. There might be some bonds in there. Yeah. So it's like uh, investing with bumper bars and easier because yeah. you don't have to worry about how much you're investing. It kind of automatically rounds up. So $4.50 becomes 5 bucks. And you just select which one, which portfolio you want and it automatically does that for you. But that is different to a brokerage account because in a brokerage account, you have choice and you have more flexibility. Yeah. So you can choose. So you typically find that people start with raise or these types of products and then they expand or they keep raise, like I've still got raise and I invest as well yeah, in a brokerage and, account. And there's also fractional investing platforms where you might be able to buy a really small parcel of a share or ETF, like $5, mm. through something like Sharesies. Yeah. So these apps, uh, if you imagine, some people might want, say, to invest $500, but a single share of, say, a US company might be $2,000. In that case, you don't have enough to buy one full one. So what these platforms allow you to do is like split it basically with someone else. You don't know who that is, but they kind of go out and buy it for you. And then you get like 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 of a share, whatever it happens to be. Um, and so that can happen too. Um, there are pros and cons with all of those things as well, but it just kind of, the barriers to entry are so much lower. And we talked about this in episode one, Kate, is one of the barriers that hold people back. I don't have enough. Yeah. I don't have enough money. A lot of people think well, that investing something you do got to start with a huge amount of money, but there's, as we've talked about, you can start with just $5. And that is really the best way for new investors to start and get a feel for how all the processes work. I'd, especially if you're starting with a new brokerage account, I would get a feel for it with $5 or $500, depending on which platform you're using to just make sure you're super comfortable with how everything works, how all the features play out. Mm. Uh, People will be wondering, well, how do I find out which brokers are available? There is a link in the show notes, um, but you can actually go to the ASX website. So the ASX runs the stock exchange in Australia, and they have a tool that allows you to kind of search for those that are licensed to trade on their stock exchange. Um, but what you'll find is that there's a, there's, I don't even know, there'd have to be dozens and dozens and dozens of these things now. And people get so overwhelmed. They just think, well, 
you know, what, what, what should I do? And this is one of the first choices you have to make. The two places where people get um, paralysis by analysis is choosing a broker and choosing which shares or ETFs to invest in. And both of them have solved pretty easily. It's kind of test drive the brokers and just pick the one you're most comfortable with, assuming that it is, you've checked that it's got the license and it's good to go, um, which most of them are. And the second thing is once you get to shares, is to keep it simple and keep it small. So pick something that looks interesting or other people have invested in and make it really small investment and just get used to the feeling. Because Kate, you will lose money eventually, right? Yeah. Um, and we're, we're breaking it to you here. You're going to lose money. <laughs> that is definitely one of the givens as investors and even experts have to deal with losing money. They're just often losing it at a much bigger scale to you and I. We might lose $50 here or $1,000 here, but we if we can make those mistakes earlier on, so at mm. the start of your journey, starting with smaller amounts. So if you do make a mistake, you can learn from it, but also the mistake is kept within bumper bars, as you said. Yeah. A lot of people think like, I've got $10,000, I've got $50,000, whatever they've got, and they've never invested. And then like, should I just invest it all at once? And I get pretty scared when people say that because I'm like, in theory, it would make sense that you should invest now and then long-term compounding. But in theory is not in practice. So people would put all that in at once and then tomorrow they wake up and go, oh my gosh, it's gone down 2%, it should sell now. So if you break it up, even start with the smallest possible amount, five bucks, 10 bucks, do that for a few months. I can guarantee you, if you do that for a few months and come back, the stock market will still be here. Yeah, and all these small <laughs> so you'll be, actions you'll be okay. build your confidence to, be, to, to become an investor because a lot of it's at that identity shift. Often if we don't think of ourselves as an investor, it's very hard to to think long term, to get our head around everything. But if we start with $5 or $500 and slowly do this on a regular basis, it reinforces to us that, hey, I'm actually an investor now. I'm putting money aside for future me to have more choices in 10 and 20 years time. And I think that helps um, keep that long term mindset and keep that habit going. Absolutely, it does. Yeah. So, are brokerage accounts safe is a good question. We get a lot. Um, they are regulated in Australia, highly regulated, just like ETFs are regulated. Um, and so go ahead, check. We've got a guide on this. Check to make sure that the broker is licensed. Um, you've probably heard stories of like, you know, got worried about things going down before, but you know we are very well regulated here in Australia. And if you go with one of the names that's well established, been operating for a very long time, it seems to be a good guide to the businesses that have the right um, fail safes and insurance and those types of things in place. We don't recommend brokers here um, on the Australian Finance Podcast or even at RAS generally. We do not make a recommendation. Um, and it's not because we're scared to. It's just that we don't want to fall into the trap of having like, but you said this and that. that <laughs> and and a lot that. of mm. individual preference comes into it. Owen and I use different brokers and mm. I we do, yeah. use a few different brokers for different jobs. So some, things, some brokers are better at doing certain things than others. And that's why, um, but don't overcomplicate it at the start, essentially. Yeah. Just try a couple, pick one and make that very first investment. Yep. And when we say, so when we say start investing, what we're saying is start as small as possible. If it's 500 bucks maybe, or if it's micro investing, just do that and get comfortable with the emotions and start to learn and feel what it's like to be invested and see your money in real life. But remember one thing is that investing is a long-term pursuit. It's not something that is going to happen this month, this week. It's going to take years. And if you just think like that, you'll start to remember that all those hot ideas, those shiny objects that the friend telling you to go and invest in this thing, it's really exciting, it's going to change the world. You don't need to worry about those things because those things are the more risky things. It's like in meditation. You acknowledge the thought and you let it go. Yeah. And what might be right for your friend is not right for you. So we're going to cover what happens logistically. Yes. Once you actually get your account in a later episode. Yeah, there's a few things to keep in mind there once you make your very first investment in a share or an ETF, and that'll be a whole separate episode. So we'll we'll have you covered there. And coming up in the next few weeks of investing month, we're going to cover shares, ETFs, managed funds and cash. So you have some ideas of what you can invest in. Yes, we're going to go a bit deeper. So we've so far we've covered like an introduction to why you should invest. Everyone knows you should because it helps you get ahead financially and provide for your community or friends or family. Uh, we discovered that there's so many different things you can invest in. Now we've told you how you can invest in most of them, not all of them. You can't buy a property through your brokerage account, but you can buy a lot through your brokerage account. Next, we're going to dive into each of the things that you really want to know about. Things like shares, 
things like where do you put your cash, things like well, what is a managed fund and why does this matter to me? We're going to cover all those things and more in the next few episodes. And remember, you can send us your questions. We will be taking questions at the end of the series. There's a link in the podcast description. So we'll have a special investing Q&A at the very end of Investing Month. We will indeed, Kate. So this is heaps of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone.